Welcome to Flashpoint, the Fire Inside podcast, featuring leadership and team building principles designed to ignite your inner fire. Now, your host, international speaker and best selling author, Frank Viscuso. All right, we're here with John Wright, captain from Flower Mound, Texas, a friend of mine who I had the honor to meet and spend a little time with. And John shared with me a little bit about his story of what happened in June 2011. It's a it's a really uh, interesting story I think we can all learn from. John, welcome to the show. Hey, man, thanks for having me. Man, I'm real happy that you took time to sit down and talk with us. And, and uh, you and I were talking a little bit earlier. You spent some time as a volunteer when you were in college and now a career firefighter. How many years on the job do you have now? Um, I've got 22 or 23 um, I think it was 94 or 95 when I started. Um, I worked for the city of Huntsville as a volunteer, and they had a really unique arrangement where if you could live in the fire station all the time, but you had to be on duty on a mini pumper um, at, on nights and weekends and holidays. And then the paid guys would be on it during the day. So we, we had a one guy on a mini pumper that was first due to everything. Um, and that went to car wrecks, structure fires, grass fires, and everything else. Um, and if you got on scene and needed more help, you get the man alarm, and the rest of the volunteers showed up. So it was, uh, man, trial by fire. It was you, you were by yourself yeah. for 15, 20 minutes a long time on scene. Um, and it was a very, very good learning experience working there. I loved it. Um, I fought fire constantly in that department. And, and John, was it... Work was this something that to to live there and get those benefits? The trade off was you volunteer your time while you're going to school. Yes, yeah. Okay. So I had I had free free uh, rent while I was going to college. I got, you. which is excellent. So, and is and that I went? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, so say, and then in '99, um, um, I got I got hired in Flyermount, which is up near Dallas. Yeah, and I have been there ever since. Yeah, it's a great department. Now, when you were volunteering, is that where you said, hey, forget what I'm going to school for. This is what I want to do. Yeah, because I was um, going to school to get a degree in criminal justice. I actually got a bachelor's in criminal justice. But about three years into that uh, degree, I, I kind of figured out that nobody likes cops. I was like, I'm going to be a fireman instead. You know, no, you know, not many people shoot a fireman. Everybody shoots the cops. So, um and my, my dad worked for the sheriff's department and he wanted me to be a cop. And I told him, Hey man, I'm, I'm going to be fine. But he's like, God dang it. <laughs> he lost you. <ya. laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, um, you, you had a mayday incident and I think you and I, again, we spoke earlier and, and I think we subscribe to the same school of thought where uh, experience is not necessarily the best teacher. Other people's experience is the best teacher. And if we can have an opportunity to, to learn from from someone else's incident. And we're so good at collecting information in the fire service that there's no shortage of incidents to learn from. But if we can learn from that incident, we could benefit from it. And here's a great situation where, where we can talk to the person uh, who called in your instance, who called the Mayday, which I listened to the transmissions. And every time I hear those transmissions, I mean, I'm an incident commander. Every time I hear those things, I get chills of my spine. So um, but you guys had been doing May Day training leading, you know, a couple years prior to this incident. Am I right? Um, that's correct. And we had been doing a lot of it. Um, yeah. And it was it was a deal where, where my captain had gone to the uh, National Fire Academy and they have that room where you get all the free CDs, training right. CDs and stuff. Yep. So he brought like 30 of those things back and we were just going through all the different um CDs that he had brought back, and one of them was a May Day deal. Um, so we watched it. It was like thirty minutes long, and we were like, "Man, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't have any May Day training that we do." So let's let, let's figure that out and let's let's do some for the department. So we got we got our our station or our shift trained. Um, we went out to uh, Dallas Fort Worth International Airport because they have a May Day. Um, simulator where they had a mayday a mayday room where you can crawl around in the dark and they put a carabiner on your pack that's attached to a rope and they simulate right. being stuck or hung up on something 
And we um, so it's kind of like a mass we, confidence course where you can get uh, trapped or entangled. Yeah, but it was like really simple. There was just four stations. It was you get you get hung up or you get lost. They close the door once you go into a room, and it was just to to get you used to recognizing. Oh, I'm in one of the parameters where I'm supposed to call a mayday. Then I'm going to call a mayday. Right. And it was like just kind of like muscle memory as far as what to say, what information to give, um, because nobody knew, you know, what lunar was or um, you can or, or any of the things that we, you know, acronyms that we use. Right. And lunar standing for location, unit name, actions, resources. You can being the unit conditions, actions, and needs. Yeah. And so you guys developed SOPs around all of this and yeah, we, we built an SOG, got the whole department trained. Um, so it was over the course of several years, we were, we were doing just, just doing a constant, our station was doing a constant stream of beta training. Right. Um, so when, when we, when we got to the point in that, in that incident where I had a parameter, um, that we had trained on, it was I need to call a mayday, and and even even then I was involved in all the training. Um, I still couldn't rem- remember Lunar. I remember thinking I don't have time for this acronym. So the mayday transmission that came out was just, um, it just came out. But and you know, you, there was, you did say mayday, 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 which you know the yeah. key is to get that recognition first. Yes. And and then what happened? You just didn't know. Um, I just kind of started talking, and and, okay. and 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 what came out was just the result of training. Okay. Um, and then when I had said it, um, everybody on scene was in just complete disbelief, and the incident commander was like, "Did he just? Did someone just call Mayday on this on this incident?" And he asked me to repeat right. it, and he got a very short Mayday the second time. Well, and then I dropped them radio. Let's leading up to this. Let's do this. Let's paint a picture for the listener of ad, exactly what led up to the mayday. Because all right, so you'd been doing training. Um, you you kind of had an idea of through muscle memory and through the training of what you're supposed to do. Um, I guess you established some sort of a daily routine, and we'll get into all of this. But but on the day of the fire, um, if I'm not mistaken, it had been. It'd been hot leading up to it, but on this particular day, you had some high winds. Uh, yeah, a call came in of a possible structure fire, and it was, what, 3,500 square foot, uh, two-story residential? That's correct. Three-car garage. Um, and it, it was it was 90, 95 degrees at 10 o'clock at night during that, um, that time of year. Okay. And we had probably 30 to 40 mile an hour winds um, that were blowing all day. And, you know, we were all pretty positive we were going to get a grass fire or something out of it. Right. And the, the fire started in the garage. Attached. Um, yeah. And, and they still didn't figure out what caused it, whether it was electrical or whatever. Um, but it was burning in the garage for quite a while before anybody noticed it because it was 9, 939. And that was in a neighborhood uh, with a lot, a lot of young families. So, you know, kids are all in bed. Parents are all whooped from trying to get the kids in bed, and, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, there's not, you know, a lot of people outside walking around at 930 at night. So it had a 15-minute head start. Um, and the fire wasn't really even noticed until it broke through the roof of the garage. Okay. So it was ripping um, when the 911 call came in. And the, the guys that, that were in that district, they could see the smoke from their station when they left the station. And they, they transmitted that over the radio, so we all knew um, that we had a working fire. Okay. And it was early on in my captain career. Um, it was my first structure fire, working structure fire as a captain. So I was hyped. Um, you know, I was, we're, we run three man three man engines most all the time. Um, so we had a driver, a guy riding backwards, and me. And we were, I believe, third on them. Third, the truck. third engine company or third company? Yeah. Okay. Third, third company. We had the engine three, medic three, arrive first, um, truck one, 
and I believe it was us. Okay. So we get on scene, uh, and there's a couple of videos. I don't know if you can link to um, that are up. I have up, up on YouTube that kind of show uh, what some of the neighbors had filmed. Um, just he- heavily involved garage fire at that point, um, but we had we were all moderately sure that the uh, fire hadn't gotten into the house yet because we had a crew that went in the front door and wrapped around with a two and a half and set up right there at the, at the door between the house and the garage and they were fighting fire from there and the fire hadn't gone out, gotten past them on the first floor there. Okay. So we had a two and a half on it from the inside of the house. They're fighting fire truck companies inside doing a search. We get on scene I see that the truck's there. I see that there's a two and a half stretched. Um, so, you know, we had we had a, a attack line in place. We had a search crew in place. And I was trying to think about, you know, what our assignment's going to be so I can get the right tools. And we get to the command post, and I'm thinking that we're going to go um, help attack the fire. Right. The, the battalion chief said, go to the second floor, do a primary search. And I said, where's the truck? He said, they're on the first floor looking for a dog. I was like, all right, I guess I can go do a search. Um, but I didn't bring any search tools with me at all. My engine was way behind me. Okay. I was like, I can't, I can't run back to the engine and grab tools. Uh, cause the bad chiefs, he, he's going to twist. So I looked at the house again. I said, you know what? I've been in these houses a hundred times. They're all the exact same. You know, you've got a, a giant living room downstairs and a master bedroom upstairs. You've got three bedrooms and a half bath and maybe a game room. I'll run upstairs, knock the search out and get back downstairs. And then I can go do what I wanted to do, which was fight fire. Right. Um, because, you know, at, still at that point, we all thought that the, the fire was stopped at the garage. <laughs> And we had a high suspicion the house was occupied because there wasn't anybody outside. There was cars in the garage. Um, somebody heard an iPhone inside ringing with that standard, you know, AT and T ringtone that the iPhones all had. Mm-hmm. Um, and and people are are never more than five feet away from an iPhone. They own one, mm-hmm. so if you hear one ringing inside the house, it's a pretty good chance there's somebody pretty close to it. Right. So. Um. Turned out that they weren't home. They were having a birthday dinner with a wife. So we hit the front door. There's some smoke in the house. I can see the truck company walking through the kitchen doing their search and find the staircase, head upstairs. When we get to the top of the stairs, it's floor to ceiling smoke, um, dark brown smoke. And there wasn't a lot of heat with it. It was just complete zero visibility, thick, soupy, dark brown, dark black smoke. And I remember thinking, man, what? I, I don't want to be in here. And I had this weird gut feeling in my stomach that I dismissed as nerves. And, you know, hey, this is your first fire as a captain. Get up there and do your damn job. So we start doing a, a left-hand search, uh, and we're walking. You know, we're not on our knees crawling around. We're walking. Um, and we each have uh, a long pike pole, and I had a, a, a tick or a thermal imager attached to my belt on my SCBA, on my you, pack. You So you had the pike pole because that's a tool you were bringing in to, what, prop the garage doors open or, or to no, pull ceilings? Um, like the, the previous two garage fires, we had we had all grabbed trash hooks and long poles and just raked everything out on the driveway. Okay. Um, and, and put everything out. So that, that was what I assumed right, yeah, right. decided to do. But that's a tool you had, so that's a tool you went in and searched yeah. with, right? Yes. Okay. And, and I usually set this up beforehand. We did, I did, multiple very, very, very stupid things during this incident. Like, it, this was completely my fault. Um, it was a lot of complacency. It was a lot of laziness. It was a lot of inexperience. Um, and then it was a lot of bad luck. So if, if, if you're listening to the story and you're catching yourself thinking, you know, what were you thinking? Um, that's the point of this, of this podcast and the point of the classes that I taught that I wasn't thinking. That's what the problem was, is that I had screwed up 
had so many little places that they all lined up like stacking dominoes up. And as soon as something bad happens, somebody bumps the table, here come the dominoes start crashing down. And because of the things that I'd set up, um, it made it um, very difficult to survive. Right. And we did survive. I don't, I don't want to spoil the end of the story. You know, we didn't die. Well, we're talking, so, that's a good thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, again, this, this is why um, I want you to share this story because National Fallen Firefighters Foundation had, you know, we all know what the top causes of line of duty deaths are, but they came out with a list of contributing factors. And one of them was complacency. And another one was accidental success, which is really interesting when we, when we think about that, because what, what they're basically saying is, um, you know, we're, we're having success doing things a certain way. And even if it's not the right way, we tend to continue doing it that way. It's that whole uh, normalization of deviance concept, right? And, and some of that was a factor into this, but you were with um, one firefighter and he was early on in his career. How, how many, how much time on the job did he have? I think he had five years, five or six years. Five or six years. So it's a two year, you're doing a search. It's, 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 you know, thick, dark smoke. You really have no visibility. Um, you, you move down the hallway. What happens next? So we hit the first bedroom. We, we find a bed, you know, bump into it and sleep the bed, kind of, kind of poke around both sides of it. You know, look, I, I really assumed we were going to find somebody in that room. Um, and, you know, nobody's in there. We went to the next room. It was a bathroom. I remember feeling a uh, tile with my pipe pole because um, I was at least sound on the floor. Right. And um, hit tile. And I sent Gus in there to do a quick sweep of the bathroom. Got to the third room, which didn't have a door, just an opening. Um, it was a, like a media room. They had a, a TV and a couch and a little uh, exercise bike or something in there. And as soon as we walked through the threshold of that door, I looked down to my left and there was this perfect rectangle of, of orange on the, on the wall. Like a, it was, it was the air return vent for the air conditioner. Okay. Um, and, and then it, I was like, Oh, well that's why there's smoke in, up here. There's fire behind this wall. It's, it's coming through the attic. It's coming through the walls up here. Um, and I told Gus, who was my firefighter, that, hey, there's there's fire behind this wall, and then for whatever reason, it was he he can't even explain why he did it. He chunks his pipe pole through the sheetrock, um, where where that thing was, and there was fire everywhere. I mean, it just blew straight through the wall. It was like a a column of flames, like from Revelations, like a biblical column of flames. It just blew right across the the room hit the wall and started rolling back over our heads. And, and my first instinct at that point, um, wasn't, Oh my gosh, we're, we're going to burn up was I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get written up because we punched a hole in this wall and without, we're going to burn this house right, without a hose line there to put the fire yes. out, which I, yeah, and we should mention that for new firefighters. Yeah. This is the right tactic to take when we have a line with us. We don't have a line with us. You know, yeah. it's not, the correct, and, and for the record, there's also um, several other well-documented and highly publicized incidents where firefighters had been injured, where this occurred there as well. So, you know, when Gus saying he can't explain why he's done it, there's other firefighters from, from, from some pretty uh, successful companies and departments throughout the country that have done this as well. So, yeah. you know, this goes back, you know, to, I guess... You know, what we talked about a little bit earlier is maybe complacency and training and, and and maybe not properly preparing the firefighters to know exactly when to do, which seems to be a simple task, you yeah. know, but when you to know, do he, it properly. But, you know, there was there was a fire he had gone to where his captain said, you know, open the walls up. Right. And he's, <laughs> he's thinking but about that. Yeah. Right. So there was just fire everywhere else. And, you know, and we'd only walked two feet into this room. So the, the door that we had came through, the opening we came through was, was literally, I, I could have reached out and touched it with my hand. Right. So I tell him we got to get out of here. Um, and I, I, I wanted to run downstairs and this was just, just in the flag, you know, blink of an eye. My, and my initial 
plan at that point was I needed to run downstairs. I need to find a fire hose. I need to run back upstairs, put this fire out before anybody figures out what we just did. That was my first blink of an eye. Mm-hmm. Best best idea in my brain. Yeah, come up that's with. your knee jerk yeah. reaction. Yes. Right. I got to put this fire out. So we turn around to leave, still walking, still on our feet at this point. And I've got my hands out in front of me looking for the uh, the banister to the, the staircase. And because, you know, I don't want to trip and you know break an ankle falling down the stairs. So I'm walking with my hands out in front of me looking. Um, still no good visibility. And the next thing I see is the hole that we had just punched with that pipe hole. Mm-hmm. So we had not left the room. Wow. And and I had, I had I switched from I'm going to get written up instantly is I'm going to burn to death in this room because I'm lost. You know, I, we we've either wandered into another part of the house that has another room that's on fire with a hole in the wall, or we have not left the room that we're in. Mm. Um, and it was it was it was it was a terrifying realization that I was lost inside of a room that was fully involved or becoming fully involved. Right. And I heard on the radio, um, our dispatch telling the incident commander that it was time for a par. We do pars, you know, every 15, 10, 15 minutes. Um, and the pars at that time took forever because you had to go individually through each unit that was on scene and, and ask them if they had a par and nobody paid attention. You know, you always had to repeat right. units. So I'm like, if I don't get this Mayday transmission out before that PAR check starts, I'll never get it out. So in the audio, you hear dispatch say, it's time for your first PAR. And the battalion chief says, command received. And then boom, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Um, and we, it was, uh, it wasn't a good lunar. Um, you know, and we had trained over and over and over and over and over of doing lunar. Um, the, the Mayday was second floor, left-hand search. We've got fire coming through the walls. We're lost. Um, but about eight times faster than what I just said it. Mm-hmm. And and the guys, some of the guys that were on scene said that when they heard the Mayday, everybody just stopped and was in complete disbelief because that, still at this point, we had a garage fire. Yeah, We didn't have a fire inside the house. Uh, the first floor was very tenable. There wasn't any, any problems in the first floor, just light smoke. Um, and nobody had been upstairs except for me and Gus. So incident commander said, can you repeat the mayday? Um, and I, I said, second floor left-hand search were lost, and I dropped the lapel mic. And I just stood there, staring at this freaking hole in the wall, like a deer-in-the-headlight look. Um, and my brain was just spinning, trying to come up with you know, a reason why is there so much fire in this room right now? Why, why is there a hole in the wall? Why are we not in the, on the stairs? Why are we still, you know, it was just everything. My, my, my mind was searching for something, some kind of solution to come up with to get me out of this situation. And my entire career, um, I had every time we went to a training class where somebody said, hey man, complacency kills. Then they tell you a story about, you know, six New York firemen that, rode up in an elevator to a to an apartment building that had false alarms 10 times a day. And then right. the one time that they get there, it's, uh, you know, fully involved. The elevator doors open and the guys all burn up. So they, they tell these complacency kill stories, and then they, they talk about something that happened. And I was always like, yeah, man, complacency kills those guys in New York a lot. Or complacency kills guys in Phoenix all the time. You know, it doesn't happen, doesn't happen here. Not mm-hmm. going to happen to me. So it was a lot of, of denial and complacency and, and of not and just that general fireman mentality of I'm, you know, freaking invincible. You know, John, when we were having lunch that day, you said something really interesting. You said, I used to read these stories and hear about these stories where firefighters lost their lives and they're laying underneath that window. And you were telling me, you said, I remember thinking, brother, how come you couldn't get out? You were so close. Yeah. And here you yeah, are in a situation where you're close to a window and all of a sudden, you know, your, your logical thinking is hindered to a point where you're just not functioning properly. Yeah. And, and that frustrated me even more because I, I had, 
up until that point, I thought I was a pretty intelligent man. Um, and I, I, I didn't know what to do. I just stood there and stared at that hole in the wall. And, and Gus had, thank God, he, he thought that I had everything under control up there because, because he was still calm at yeah. that point and he was enjoying the, the fire. <laughs> he was like, man, it was rolling over our heads. It was awesome. It was everywhere. He's like, it's getting hot, but he has no idea what's cool. happening in your mind. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Um, so he said that when he, when he heard me call a mayday, he was like, Oh, Oh, dang, this is serious. I'm going to find a window. So he goes back to the, the closest wall to him and happens to find this bank of windows. It was like four windows across. And they were two feet wide. Um, no, they were 14 inches wide, two feet tall and about I don't know, three, four, four feet off the ground. So that were kind of hard to get into. So he, he finds the windows and yells, hey, I found some windows, and I hear that, and I snap out of my little trance or whatever and go to where his voice was. Um, and I started pounding all these windows with my hands, trying to break the glass. And he was like, Captain, 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 just unlock them, unlock them, and raise them up. So he unlocked his window and raised it up. Um, he unlocked my window and raised it up because I couldn't get my fingers to work on, on the, uh, the window lock. And I was thinking, oh, it's my gloves. Um, but it was, you know, you know, more, everything that happened for the next 90 seconds, um, just compounded with the things that had happened before just got worse and worse and worse. So, um, I didn't know what to do to begin with, found some windows, couldn't get the windows open. So I'm trying to smash them with my hands because like I said, the tools we had were freaking eight foot pike poles. Right. So I'm not going to back up and, and run that pike pole through the window. We dropped those things immediately. Um, so he gets the window open and looks out and sees that there's a little bitty roof underneath the window. It was like a breakfast nook on the first floor. So he, he gets through the window and gets his air pack stuck, comes back in the room, takes his air pack off, um, so has his face mask on the regulator, sets the air pack out, climbs up the window, he's out. And I'm watching him, and he's much smaller than I was. Um, man, if he's having trouble getting through his window, they ain't no one in hell and getting out of his window. So I jump into the window. Well, we should say, yeah, yeah, you're, you've got a big frame. How, how tall are you, John? Six, two. Six, two. You know, and you look like so, you, you look like you've played football at some point in your yeah. life. I haven't missed many meals. <laughs> so, so he gets through the window and now we're face to face. And I didn't see if there was a roof under the window. I didn't really even make the connection. Um, I, I assumed that when I cleared the glass, I'm going to the ground. And so I don't even put two and two together that Gus is still magically floating in front of the window. <clears throat> and at, at that point, he was just in the way of, of what I was trying to accomplish, was, which was, I want out of this window. I want out of this room. And so he's yelling, take your pack off. And it, it, it angered me because I was thinking, why, why would you tell me to take my air pack off in a room that, that's fully involved? That, that's, that's the worst idea you've ever had in your life, Gus. And I, I was getting mad at him. Um, and I, every time I went into the window, my air pack would hit. I'd fall back into the room. And and, I, and every every attempt that I made to get out of the window was just worse and worse and worse. And he's, he's trying to grab a hold of anything he can. Um, I'd, I'd loosen my air pack straps to get the bottle down a little bit lower and, and kept trying to go through the window. And it, it wasn't working. I was running out of energy. It was getting hot. Um, I thought my mask had fallen off because the air in my tank was, was heated up to a point where it was almost hard to breathe. It's like a hairdryer blowing in your face. And I, I, I made the, the realization that I wasn't getting out of the room. And I, I had lost almost all vision. I could see like a four-inch circle in front of my face where I could see everything was black. It was like looking through a, a paper towel tube. Um, everything that I could hear was muffled, like I was underwater. Um, I couldn't see anything past Gus. It was just, th there's somebody standing in front of me yelling at me, and they're in the way of the window I'm trying to jump out of. Mm. And, and I got to the point where I, I realized I'm not going to make it. I've tried. I'm out of energy. I'm out of time. The fire's here. It, it, it's it's hot enough that it's going to kill me. 
And I remember feeling like the sponginess of carpet under my boots. And I'm like, I'm standing on carpet. Where I'm standing is where they're, where they're going to find my body. And I went to lay down. And it wasn't lay down to, um, <clears throat> you know, get lower because, you know, heat rises or whatever. It was lay down and, and let it burn. Let it burn you. Die. Whatever. Give up. And, and that was the worst You're right, buddy. You know, John, what happened to you is not, you know, we're talking about human psychology here as much as, as anything else and, and combat stress, which we've spoken about before. And the steps and the things that have occurred to you will occur to people in certain times when, you know, their heart rate decrease increases, they start losing uh, facilities and the ability to do things that are simple in a, in a normal, I guess, non-threatened environment, you yeah. know? And so, I mean, and you've read about this since, you know, what happened to you is something that has happened to many other people. Yeah. And it was, it was months after the incident that I found this information. And this is the absolute most important part of this whole podcast is, right. is you know, from, from my viewpoint is, is what, what, what this combat stress is. And it's not PTSD. This is, this is combat stress that happens during combat right now. Right. And, and I thought that I was, a, you know, a, a freaking wuss, like giving up. You know, I'd always thought, you know, an angel of death shows up. I'm not going. You know, I'm going to punch him in the freaking nose, take his little sickle and break it over my knee. You know, you know death, you ain't coming for me. Um, but I'd totally given up. I mean, the, my plan at that point was to burn to death, and I was okay with that. So, mm. as I was going to take a knee, um, th- what you mentioned before, um, I, I started remembering all all the line of duty death reports that I had read, where they found guys dead under a window, or, or dead right by the front door, or dead you know on the hose line somewhere. And every time I read those, I'm like, well, why Why did you give up? You were so close to being able to get out to get out. So I remember standing up and, and thinking, I'm not going to be an email. And I jumped into the window one more time. Um, and what, what was happening on the other side of the glass was, was Gus, when he took his air pack off, it slid down the roof, started pulling on his mask. He, he unhooked his regulator. Uh, so he's standing in front of a vent hole, without a mask on, fighting to, to, to get me out of this room. And he, he had said, man, I've got one more one more pull on him, and then I'm going to go back in the window and push him out from the inside was his plan. Mm. So as I'm jumping up for my last jump, he's leaning in for his last pull. He grabbed both of my air pack straps, planted his feet against the side of the wall, and just did an upright row. And out I came. And I went from the most horrific moment of my entire life instantly to the happiest like you, I just won the lottery at that point. Right. And he, he pulled me onto the roof and I just instantly went from, from, you know, the worst parts of the Bible to, to, yeah, I'm, I'm a millionaire. I was on the lottery. Mm-hmm. I remember laying on the roof and I was telling him, I said, don't touch me. Don't touch me. I'm just going to lay here the rest of the night. Don't touch me. Leave me alone. Happy to be out. And, and he's yelling, we got to get off the roof. We got to get off the roof. And I remember thinking, damn, you're right. It's hotter. <laughs> out here on the roof and it was inside. Well, as soon as I came through that window, um, it was like seven seconds after that, the room flashed. Wow. So, you know, when, when you, when you take these training classes, if somebody tells you, Hey man, if you're lost or whatever, or you're hung up, you know, try to free yourself for 30 seconds or a minute and then call a medic. It's bull crap. Like the instant that you know that you are in a parameter that requires a mayday, you call the mayday. And listen, and, and you're saying that from a person who is experiencing it on the inside. I'll tell you my take on it from, again, from an incident commander standpoint. I need time. I'm going to need time to get resources and people to somebody if that happens, if they call yeah. it. So the sooner you can do it, the better. Don't well, you know? I think you know when we talk to people, or when I've spoken to people who've hesitated to call Maydays. A lot of times it came down to a little bit of pride, a little bit of ego. A little bit of them saying, um, hey, I, you know, there was a, a little part in the back of their mind saying, I don't want to be ridiculed. 
because yeah. if I call this and, and when I get back to the fire station and you have to get rid of yeah. that because you train enough that, that you'll know if you're in trouble, if that, if this makes sense. And so if you have to call one, you have to be prepared to do that so we can have time to get to you. Yeah. Cause yeah, it ain't instant, you know, and the RIT team, um, they, they did a hell of a push to get up there to where we we're at. Um, they, they got to the top of the stairs and, and looked in the room with the thermal imager and the, the screen was just solid white. Right. Without uh, a line, they, they're not getting in there either. No, no. And he, he had said, I hope God, I hope they're not in there. Um, mm. And he had told his firefighter, stay here. I'm going to go in there and look. And he's fixing a crew in that damn room. Um, but, but he had heard Gus on the radio at that point. We're on the roof. The room just flashed. It's, it's rolling over our heads and on the roof. So we get off the roof and, and Gus gets on the radio and yells, he's coming off the roof. Um, talking about me coming on the ladder. So the red team hears that and they back out, get outside. So get everybody out of the house. Um, they get us to the front yard and, and my vision and hearing started coming back and it, it, it kind of all came back together and got us to the hospital. And then we're talking, you're talking about the, uh, pride, um, riding home from the hospital. Think about that the whole way home, man, I'm going to get freaking ridiculed. You know, screwing up, and um, and got home and saw my son sleep on the couch with a friend of ours, and picked him up, put him back in bed, and and we're talking about he's what two, three years old at this time. Yeah, yeah. I tell you, I hate telling stories. <laughs> so, <clears throat> picked him up, kissed him on the forehead, put him back in bed, and I made the realization. I could care less what people think. Right. Right. So, I get that. You know, you call me what you want. I got to go home. Well, so, I, I'll tell you, I, I call you very brave. I call you very brave because you're a guy who, who is willing to share a story to help other firefighters because it's, you have to, we have to share the story of what happened to you so we can talk about a little bit about combat stress like we just spoke about, but about lessons learned from it. I mean, that's the goal. The goal is to take the lesson away from it. And I think, so, you know, go ahead. I was, I was going to get right into that combat stress because I really want people to hear this part. I want you to understand this is real. It happens. And it's uh, something you can't control. It, it, it's built into your freaking genes, DNA, evolution, whatever, whatever. So when your mind makes the connection that you're about to die, there, there's a, a certain list of things that happens. And I don't know if it's, if, if it's your mind preparing yourself to have an easier death. Um, because I'd always been told fight or flight kicks in and you get freaking stronger and smarter and faster. You know, leap tall buildings in a single bound. I, I didn't get that. I didn't get any of that fight or flight stuff. Right. But once you get past a certain a certain stage or a certain heart rate, um, the, the fight or flight's no longer an option. So let's say you're you're sitting at sitting at home, with whatever, resting heart rate eighty beats a minute. Go to a structure fire, ramps up a little bit, get on scene, you're at 100, 120 beats a minute or so, something bad happens. And and it, it, it's a life or death situation. The first thing you're going to lose is fine motor skills. Um, and this is this is outlined in a book by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. Uh, the book's called Physiology of Close Combat. And it's an awesome book. Um, he's also got a website at killology.com, which is where I got this little graphic from. We'll mention so, that book on, on our website, too, so we can yeah. leave a link for it if anybody wants to get a hold of it. And it, it's mostly about like uh, military police officers, combat. Um, talks about the, the psychology of killing another person, another human. So, not much about firefighting, but but this particular part is exactly what happened to me in that room. So, the first thing you lose is fine motor skills, and and we in the fire service kind of know this. Um, on our portable radios that we carry, if you turn all the way to the right or all the way to the left, you're back on channel one. So, if you get into a situation where you need to get to dispatch, you know, you need somebody to hear you. Spend that radio knob. Either way, either way, you'll be back on channel one. So, 
fine motor skills, um, which would explain why I couldn't unlock the window. Right. Then the next thing that you lose as your heart rate continues to go up would be complex motor skills, which would be climbing through a window or, or doing that little, that little, that little ladder bail that everybody does with the save your own class where you go out head first, yep. and hook your arm to swing your legs. Yeah. Um, I've got a challenge to, to find a video of a fireman coming out of a window, a room that's on fire. That is not a training tower performing that maneuver. Yeah. I looked, I looked for hours and weeks and I cannot find one instance where somebody had done that complex maneuver because we do it maybe once a year, maybe once every three years, um, whenever we do the saving your own program. And if, if you haven't trained on something extensively, when you get to this situation, it's not available. Right. You don't, you don't get to use that, um, during, during this process. So, complex motor skills, then you lose the ability to see tunnel vision. Um, you lose depth perception. You lose near vision. You have what's called auditory exclusion, which is tunnel hearing, which is everything sounds muffled. I had every one of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I've used the word tunnel vision multiple times in my career. Like, yeah, we're doing CPR and we got tunnel vision. Didn't notice it. We kicked the IV tubing out and we're pumping epi all over the floor of the ambulance. Um, this was actually like looking through a tunnel where everything was black and all I could see was just a small circle in front of my face. Wow. And if you get through that stage, the very last stage is the irrational fighting or fleeing, uh, freezing during the headlight, submissive behavior, um, giving up and laying down. Um, you have just massive vasoconstriction all over your body where your, your, your body is trying to keep the blood in your brain and your heart. And that's it. Um, they had said that they looked through my mask and saw my face and it was bleach white. Um, then you have voiding of bladder or bowels, which didn't happen. And even if it did happen, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> uh, and the book talks about, that's like the most underreported part of this, this process. Cause guys don't want to talk about that. Um, and then, and then at the very, very end of that, um, you have like your gross motor skills are at their highest performance level, like throwing a punch. You can throw a punch at that point. You have like your Geronimo moment. Um, I think the book talks about you've got like for 10 seconds, you've got a hundred percent of your, of your abilities. Like if you can bench press 300 pounds, you can bench press 300 pounds for, for 10 seconds. After that it drops in half and then 10 more seconds, it drops in half again. And it gets to the point where you can't just support the weight of your body. You can't stand up and, you know, you know just end up going down. So I had no idea that this, this, this kind of thing was a, was a thing. And for months I had thought, you know, I was just a coward who had just given up. Um, and finding this information was, was very beneficial to, to my uh, psyche and, you know, ability to go back to work. Right. And I never heard about it ever. No, no one talked about this in fire academy or um, even any CEs. You know, we're always we're, we're these big, you know, awesome firemen, knights in shining armor, or whatever. We got these big fancy tools and nice gear, and you know, nobody's going to get us. Um, but you have a breaking point, all of you. Everybody does. There, there is a point that um, that happens, and and when once you get into this. This little hormone-induced heart rate, um, you know, thing, it you can't get out of it until, you, until you're safe. Um, and a lot of times, you know, guys will be in this situation. We'll get them out. We'll take them to the front of the structure or whatever and sit them down. The guys will run back into the building. Or they'll, they'll do stupid stuff. They won't give their air packs up. Like, you have to transport them to the hospital, breathe in air, doing, doing bottle swaps. Um, so people like crazy. During, during this time. And if you notice somebody um, going down this path, like your partner is, is having issues and trouble, you start picking some of these things up. You need to get out of the building. And you need to put both hands on him, drag him to the front of the building and sit on him until he can make eye contact with you and, 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 and act you know, rational. Right. Let me, first of all, this happened again back in 2011, I think you and I met early 2016. 
and you still had marks on your arm from Gus yeah. pulling you out. Yeah, it it was the uh, icing on the cake. This deal. I mean, scars are cool, um, just in general. But but when he had grabbed me at one of the points, it it had transferred heat through my gear, and I, I have like his handprint on the wrist. Yeah, um, it's still barely visible, but there's a you know a, a row of stripes uh, where his fingers had compressed that um, hot fabric of my bunker gear around my wrist. Um, so, I mean, you know, Gus screwed up. I screwed up. He punched a hole in the sheetrock, whatever. That dude was about to crawl back into the belly of the beast with me to die with me in that mm. room. You know, he, 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 he could have gotten off the roof. He was standing in front of a vent hole, sucking down, you know, ex- you know, just nothing but straight heat, flames and black smoke. Um, you know, he burned his lips and his nose and ended up breaking one of the tendons in his hand, pounding on the windows, trying to break them to get him open. So, um, so you, it was a crappy situation. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you guys the whole, are, the whole, I'm sure you guys yeah. are very, uh, very tight today. Right. Yeah. And, and they, he, he was on my crew and they split us up because they, they were like, there's no way you could ever ride him up. I'm like, yeah. hey, you're right. <laughs> So he's on a totally different shift now. You know, you have, and, and I, w- I want to take this into the lessons learned outside of uh, just talking about combat stress, but wh- how you've changed your routine. First of all, I want to talk about Flower Mound. Yeah, I know your chief, Chief Greaser. I know what you guys have been doing with uh, really providing some high quality leadership training. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't see many departments putting the kind of effort that your department has been uh, just trying to get people prepared to do the job. You yourself, yeah. you've changed a few things. You've talked a little bit about that that domino effect, um, which is, you know, I guess to sum it up, one thing can go wrong, which could lead to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. And at some point you have to get things back on track. Is, you know, yeah, and, cause, and I've heard before of like, a, um, there's like links in a chain. And if you remove one of those links, um, the, the loss of life, life stops. And it was the same thing in our deal. So we had all these things leading up to it. We had the wrong tools. We had improper search. We had improper actions while we were in there. We were standing. We should have been crawling. We could have seen them the smoke. You know, all these little dominoes were, as we're going through the house, we're setting things up. And then the hole gets knocked on the sheetrock. Somebody bumps the table. Here come the dominoes start crashing down. And if you can reach in there and grab one of those and pull them out, remove that domino, then the, the line of duty death will stop. And this is true for almost every line of duty death incident. You can always go in there and find one thing. If they had done this one thing, um, it would have stopped. It would have stopped the incident. And I believe that initiating the May Day was, was the first thing that we did right. right. And, and that started a chain of events that, that ultimately led Gus to realize that we were in a bad situation. We self-rescued, but we had we had dudes coming. You know, help was on the way. And like you said, it takes time, man. It's the only other crews we had on scene because this was still like 15 minutes into the incident. So we still had people, we still had mutual aid companies showing up. You know, just leaving their stations too. So, um, you know, we 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 initiated the mayday. We got help started, um, but they ended up self-rescuing. So right. it's just, it is, it is so vitally important that if you think that you're in a situation where you need help, you got to ask for it. And I, I know that that's hard to do for a fireman because well, that, that's we're the ones. No, yeah, no, I, I get you. That's number one. But the other thing is trying to reproduce stressful environments when we train. Have you guys done that as so well? That, we've done a little bit of that. That is, that is incredibly dangerous. Um, mm-hmm. if you do it wrong, if you do it. So, wrong. So yeah. Um, I've got two really good friends that, that do this training, uh, Rick George and Bob Carpenter. Yeah. Um, I know them both. both mine. Yeah. So, so what, what they, they had come out and done some training with us. Um, so, so the deal is that when, when you get into a bad situation, um, the only thing that you have to use as far as tools or training or things that you're extensively training on, 
And if you think back through your career, if you've been in this for a long time, you remember those little SCBA mazes where they, they make you crawl through these impossible challenges and they get you to the right. point where there's no way you can get through. A Navy SEAL well, can get dead. through some of them. Yeah. You're up, you're dead. Go ahead and get up. Take your mask off. Go back right. to the front right. line. And they started finding out that firefighters would get in the situation. They, they stand up, pull the mask off because that's what they had done in training. Mm. So if you're going to do like this high stress training stuff um, and you don't have um, avenues of success built in, I'm not sure if I've been saying this the right way. I think I know exactly what you're saying. If we, if we're training, yeah, uh, people are going to resort right back to, to what they're taught in training. And I was yeah. watching actually a, a movie just this morning. It's a, a basketball movie. And I remember uh, they were practicing and a coach blew the whistle. And when a coach blew the whistle, everybody stopped and came over because they were about to get yelled at for doing something wrong. And it made me realize at that moment, I realized, isn't that interesting that anytime a whistle is blown during an athletic event, they know immediately to stop. Obviously the whistle is blown, but they're, yeah. they're taught that simple thing of stopping in practice because Sometimes it means they're getting in trouble, but it's the same yeah. thing with what you just said. When you said, all right, stop, you're dead. Take your mask off. Yeah. Well, so they had, a, they had a maze set up to where it was tough. And, and at each of the stations, there was an out um, that they had built in. So if, if, you know, we wanted to see how far we can get, if a guy gets to a point where he, he ain't going any farther, Hey man, there's a rope right next to you. Follow that rope to freedom. And so you'll, you grab that rope and then you make it out and they freaking high five you. Good job, buddy. Good job, hero. You know, so you felt good about, about, you know, getting through that training scenario. And a lot of guys are like, man, that's freaking, that's the wussification of the fire service. That's everybody getting a medal right there. That ain't the case because if that guy had gotten stuck again and he's thinking, Oh my God, Oh my God, I'm lost. I'm lost. His brain's going to go, man, last time we were in this situation, you did this and you got out. Right. And so now, now that's ingrained in his mind. And, um, you know, it, it's, I, I told, I totally believe that, 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 that would help. Well, you know, and, and let's take this general Hal Moore, who is a tremendous leader, uh, in, in our country. And his story was featured in, in, um, we were soldiers, the movie, and he had uh, some rules for success in con combat. One of them was there was always one more thing you could do to influence any situation in your favor. And after that, one more thing. And after that, one more thing. Yeah. And that's, I think, what you're talking about training people to do, saying, OK, what what can you do now? There's one more thing you can do and, and train people to to know you know, that, yeah. there, that there is something else you could do that, to prevent the dominoes from falling. Yeah. And it's that, you know, don't give up mentality that, that I thought I, I completely had, but ended up giving up. So, you know, and we had, we had never trained, I had never trained myself for the situation where I was lost in a room and couldn't get out. Never thought it was going to happen. All right. Well, you know, there's something else that you do that's really interesting. Now you go around and I want to, you know, as we wrap up here, I do want to give people, uh, some information from you on how they can get a hold of you if they wanted to bring you in to come in and share the story and talk about what, what you've learned. But when you go out and you teach, you solve a Rubik's cube while you're initiating your talk to a group of people. You've done this, for example, at FDIC in front of a few hundred people. Um, talk about that. Why do you do, do that? Well, well, it's freaking awesome. I'm a genius, right? Well, well listen, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've watched the tutorials on how to solve the Rubik's Cube on YouTube, and I still can't figure it out. So I'm yeah. actually quite impressed. What's funny is I tell people, you know, that if anybody thinks that I'm a genius after hearing the story, then you won't listen to the story. <laughs> so, but the uh, the Rubik's Cube, I'd, I'd, found, I'd watched that, some Will Smith movie where he solved the Rubik's Cube. I want to learn how to do that. Yeah. So I found some YouTube tutorials, like seven steps, and you just had to memorize like eight little steps, eight little turns um, for each little of, of the seven steps, and then the, the damn thing solves itself. Yeah. So I talk about you know muscle memory um, in the fire in the fire service that we that we had. I had mentioned that we had a, I had a thermal imager on my on the air pack, um, but I never grabbed it. And, and I was trying to figure out why that was and realized, you know, I take that 
imager with me to every commercial fire alarm, to every possible structure. But anytime I'm putting bunker gear on, I clip that imager to my belt. I never use it. I don't need to in a commercial fire alarm. We go through a lot of those. So I had gone through the motions of clipping this thing to my belt and letting it swing back and forth and hit me in the leg and, and never once thought about reaching out, picking it up, turning it on. Um, that could have just been the, the heat of the moment. Um, but what I had done since then to, 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 uh, to remember, to remind myself that a habit is I'll also clip it to my belt, the same place. But when I get to the front door, I reach down, turn it on, click it on. Right. Um, and then and there was another instance where after I had called the Mayday RSOG, say you activate your writ, I mean, your um, your pat, your pass device. So we had Scott air packs. And so I reached up and double clicked the button on the side of the, uh, of the gauge there. And the pass device didn't go off. So I double click the button again. And the pass device didn't go off. Just, Damn it. I'm clicking the heck out of this freaking button and, and it's not going off. So, you know, what am I doing to that, that air pack? If I'm double clicking the side button, I'm resetting it because every day when I check my air pack off, I, I double click that button. Every time I go to training, I take an air pack off. I double click that button and I might push the red button once a year during May day training. Mm-hmm. So muscle memory. Um, I was going through the motions of what I normally do with that part of the air pack. So, um, you, you've got to, you've got to realize that, yeah, muscle memory is good, but there, there's things that you're doing every day, little things, um, that can have an effect on an incident that you won't even know about. And so I, I you know, I'm solving the Ruby's cube and talking about muscle memory. And, and usually there's been two instances where I screwed it up. And couldn't get it back. I had to, I had to do it after class. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I probably taught class a hundred times. There was two times where I'd screwed up, and that was a uh, highly embarrassing. Mm. But the 90, other ninety eight percent of the time, um, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a good lesson, John. As, as we wrap up here, is there anything else you'd like to share with the people that listen to your story today? You know, the, the, the big thing is, is you're not above calling for help. Like I know you're a fireman. I know that, I know that people call you for help. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that, that you don't get to ask for help. It's the same with call mutual aid, man. If you call mutual aid to a fire and you get there and figure out you don't need them, turn them around. Mm-hmm. If you call a mayday and you find the hose line and you're out, man, cancel it. Right. It, this isn't like a big Oh my God, somebody called a May Day. Now we got to write a freaking story about it, whatever. It's just a, another part of the job. It's just part of working. You know, right. you, if, if you do something, you get in trouble, man, ask for help. Like you wouldn't hesitate to call your buddies to help move, right? And every time, every time a fireman moves, hey, I got pizza and beer, and people show up, move, hmm. you know, begrudgingly help you move. But, you know, we all know that when it's our turn, that you'll, you'll be there to help us. So it's not like you're. And you're not asking for much. You're just asking for some help. Right. You know, get your get your buddies in that room with you, and let them see how awesome the flames look rolling across the ceiling. You know, <laughs> they they get appreciated just as much as you should. So, man, you, you're not above asking for help, and and you need to be training and thinking about instances where you'll be in a situation like this. This is you, the the days of us doing oh complacency kills other firemen. That's that 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 needs to be gone. Complacency kills you. Mm. Really, if you're listening to this podcast, complacency can and will kill you if it gets the opportunity. Not guys in New York, not guys in Philadelphia, not two jack wagons in Flyer Mound, Texas. Right? Happens anywhere, anywhere in the service, anywhere in the country. John, thank you so much for uh, for your bravery and being willing to come on and share your story and and help others learn from your experience. How can people get in touch with you if they wanted to bring you in to come share the story to their department? Uh, my email address for work um, is john.wright at flower-mound.com. Um, I used to run a website that had just the media files, um, like the pictures and videos. Um, and it, it's I went ahead and took that down about six months ago because they, they had shut it off for some reason. Like, well, oh, I'm, I'm a, it's gone now. So just the email address, and I'm sure you can put a link to it. Yeah. Somewhere in the description. Yeah, we will. Uh, Probably probably the easiest way. We'll do that. We'll leave that information. And uh, 
John, thank you again, man. I really appreciate you taking this time and I'm sure I'll be running into you again. I, I come out to the Dallas area quite often, so I'm going to look you up when I get out there. Will we see oh, you yes. at any of the uh, conferences uh, throughout the year coming up, 2018? Um, I'm going to one in October here in Fort Worth. Um, that's coming up in a, in a week. And then after that, I don't have anything, anything scheduled after that. All right. Well, I'm sure we'll be connecting and I, I'm looking forward to it. My friend, thank you very much, Sean. All right, man. Thank you. I mean, you have a great day.